Well, it's good to be here this morning, and we, we trust that God will bless and encourage each one of us. It's a joy for us to realize that uh, we can come before our God and trust in Him and know His presence and blessing with us. And so, right, I think we can turn to God in prayer now. Let's pray. Our God and Father, we come into your presence this morning to praise and to worship you. We realize there is no God like unto you. We realize that we read that you were a God who was clothed in glory, and we would magnify and glorify your great name again this day. And we pray your blessing upon each one of us, that we might truly know something of the felt presence of the living God in this place. And so remember us to this end, we pray, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, then, we're going to sing. Oh, I should say, uh, Steve is standing in for Anona this morning. Anona's gone down with COVID this morning. Okay. <laughs> well, I don't know. I, I, I couldn't myself, but uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I might end up doing a solo. No, Warren likes doing solos, man. <laughs> Okay, yeah, so uh, I'm just telling you that, um, just to let you know really. So we're going to sing this to the glory of God. To God be the glory, great things He has done. So loved He the world that He gave us His Son.
Well, let me just uh, give you some announcements. Uh, after the service downstairs, uh, there will be teas and coffee being served. And this evening's service is going to be led by Tom Roberts. And then, as you know, 10.30 tomorrow, there's a coffee morning here in the church, even though Anona's not going to be here. Um, and there's uh, coming off remand, I suppose, because she's got COVID, and, or she's had COVID, and it's her last day today. That's why she's not here today. And uh, I think she's going to be taking charge. But if you anybody here who would like to help with teas and coffee, is what a chance for you now. Yeah? What a chance for you. You got a volunteer, have we? Okay. Right. Okay, then. So that's going to be held downstairs tomorrow morning at uh, 10.30. And if you want to help with teas and coffee, let me know after the service, and uh, I'll book you in. Okay. And then uh, on Wednesday night at 7 o'clock, Nathaniel was supposed to be doing the prayer meeting and Bible study, but Nathaniel's away for the next few days, so uh, it's either going to fall to me or to Mark. I haven't seen Mark yet, so I think it'll probably fall to me, I think, maybe. Um, so, yeah. And then next Sunday at 10.30 and 6 o'clock, we've got John Mark Alter from uh, Bridge Church in Cardiff. So we'll uh, remember him. It's good to have uh, Warren Jones with us again. It's good to uh, see him with us and uh, trust that God will bless and encourage him uh, along with us as we come to worship him. And so uh, I'm going to hand it over to Warren because uh, Warren is going to give uh, a children's address. So uh, I'll pass it on to him. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I was, so, I was so pleased this morning when I came to church because somebody came to me and said, a child to me, my son, a young man, really, and he said, I remember the story you told last night about Tommy. Yeah. It's amazing, wonderful. Well, I'm going to show you this. It's not about Tommy today. It's about Tumba. Now he was called Tumba because he was a monkey. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Just talk amongst yourselves a minute while I get my. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yeah. That's good, thank you. Tumba was a monkey. And he lived in the, in the village, in the jungle, with all the other monkeys and with his mum and his dad. And one day, he came home from monkey school and he said to his mum, Mum, I've decided what I'm going to be. She said, that's wonderful, Tumba. What are you going to be? He said, I'm going to be a lion. And she looked at him and says, a lion? He said, tell me, Mum, how can I become a lion? She says, hmm, I don't know. But he said, do you know anybody who might know? He said, well, there is Mr. Turtle... He's very old. He's nearly as old as Warren Jones. <laughs> and he lives at the bottom of a well, just at the edge of the village. Go and ask him. So he said, great, great. He rushed away. He came to the well and he shouted down, Mr. Tumba, Mr. Oh, sorry, Mr. Turtle, Mr. Turtle, Mr. Turtle. It echoed down. But old Mr. Turtle, because he was old, as old as Warren Jones, he was fast asleep. So he said, I'll shout a bit louder. Mr. Turtle, Turtle, Turtle. And old Mr. Turtle woke up and said, what? Who is it? He said, it's Tumba. What do you want, Tumba? I want to become a lion. How do I become a lion? Well, he says, I don't know. Perhaps if you said you were a lion and made a badge that you were a lion, perhaps you'd be a lion. See, that's a good idea. So he got a piece of card, and he wrote on it, I am a lion. And he stuck it on his front, and he went around, I am a lion, I am a lion, I am a lion, I am a lion. But when he came to his monkey friends, and they saw him, <laughs> he started to laugh. He says, you are not a liar just because you got a sign on you. So he scurried back. He said, Mr. Turtle, yes, Tumba, it's not working. He said, well, you've got a sign and you're saying it. I know the problem, he says. You're the wrong color. 
you were brown and lions are kind of a dirty yellow. He said, brilliant. So he went down to the local iron buggers and he said, I want a pot of paint, please. Which colour would you like to buy? Dirty yellow, please. So he said, no, 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 no. Oh, here it is. So he got a big pot of, tu- dirty, of dirty yellow paint, poured it into a bath, stood back, ran, jumped, splosh, till he was entirely covered with dirty yellow paint. So he stuck on his notice and he said, I go back to my friends. I am a liar. I am a... And when they saw him, <laughs> oh, dear, 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 dear. they just laughed. Oh, he ran back, Mr. Turtle. Yes, Tumba, it's not working. He said, well, maybe, he says, the problem is that you're walking on your two legs. Lions go on all four and slink. Brilliant, I'm going to do that. So he's a lovely, dirty yellow. He had his side. He was saying it, and he got down and all four, slinking. 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 Like a lion slinks. And he went up to his friends. And his friends, when they saw him, they began to, ha, 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 And he ran back to the, t- to the well. He said, Mr. Turtle, it's not working. Well, he says, perhaps you're not talking like a lion. You were just doing a monkey kind of squeak. Wee, 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 wee. He says, you need to roar. So he says, yes, he says. I'm going to practice my roar. <laughs> and then he thought, I'm not going back to my friends so they can laugh at me. I'm going up to where the lions live, in that cave at the top of the mountain. So up he goes, slink, slink, practicing his roar. And into the dark cave he goes. And at the end of the cave, there were two green lights. Can you think what those green lights were? They were the lion's eyes. So he went up to the lion. Uh, 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 slink. Slink. And that lion went. He says, you are not a lion. He opened wide his mouth with his huge teeth and he was about to snap them down on Tumba. said, yeah. When Tumba jumped out of the way, ran out to the cave, ran down the mud all the way to Mummy. He says, mummy, 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 me. I don't ever want to be a lion again. And she said, of course not. You can't be a lion because you're a monkey. You were born a monkey. To be a lion, you've got to be born as a lion. He said, oh, yes. Now, why did I tell you all that story? It's because some people want to become a Christian. So he says, I tell you what, I'm going to get a big badge. Woo! I am a Christian. I am a Christian. Does wearing a badge make you a Christian? No. So they say, well, I've seen those Christians. They go to church on a Sunday, and they all dress up nicely. So he put on his best clothes, and he went to get, no, this is, this, this is what you might want to, a Christian might want to do, put on, just dress up nice and smart, wear a collar and tie. I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. Does wearing nice clothes and having a nice wash and, and shave make you a Christian? No. So he says, I tell you what, I've been down to that church and they all sing these Christian songs. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to wear my badge. I'm going to dress like a Christian and I'm going to sing the songs. And so this is what they try to do. And they go, I am a Christian. I am a Christian. I am the singing the Christian songs make you a Christian? No. So, if dressing like a Christian, go to church like a Christian, speak bearing badges like Christians, singing songs like a Christian, doesn't make you a Christian, how on earth can you become a Christian? I've got some good news. You become a Christian. You can't, Tumba couldn't become a lion because he was born as a monkey. He'd need to be born as a lion. When we are born, we are not born as Christians. We are born as people that do wrong. But here's the good news. Jesus says, 
that we can be born all over again. Hallelujah. And so, if you want to be a real Christian, it's not dressing like a Christian, acting like a Christian, speaking like a Christian, singing like a Christian. It's coming to Jesus Christ and taking him as his saviour, taking him into your life. And when you say to Jesus, Jesus, I'm sorry that I'm a sinner. That's the way I was born. But I'm coming to you now for forgiveness because you died for me on the cross. Will you come into my life, please? And when Jesus comes and forgives us and comes into our life, then you were born all over again as if inside you're a brand new person. If you want to be a Christian, grown ups as well as children, you don't just come to church, you don't just sing the songs, you don't just say the prayers, you've got to be born again by accepting Jesus Christ as your saviour. Will you remember about Tumba next time? Tumba, Tommy last time, Tumba this time, the monkey that wanted to be a lion. Oh, if only he'd been a human being, he could have known what it was to be born all over again, to be born again by the Spirit of God. God bless you, children. Right? Well, oh, there's a song, isn't there? A children's song. I'm sorry. I forgot your song. Thank you. I was going to say, I had it in the Bible, because I thought somebody, if I could get a Bible, a big Bible. Yeah. Oh, I'm a Christian now. No, no. There's only one way to become a Christian, to be born again in your heart with Jesus. Thank you. The Christian song, the children's song. I'll do it. We're going to sing S for sin. S for sin, a dreadful thing. A for Adam who first fell. V for victory Jesus brings. I, the one who came to tell. Open up your heart to him. You, you can know his peace within. Ah, the remedy for sin. That will bring us back to J E S U S for sin, a dreadful thing. A for Adam who first fell. V for victory Jesus brings. I, I the one who came to tell. Open up your heart to him. You, you can know his peace within. Ah, the remedy for sin. That will bring us back to God. <clears throat> Just had a message from Mark saying, sorry about the streaming issues. The stream is available on Facebook, if that's of any help to anyone. I don't know. I don't know if we're connected to... Oh. We are, are we? So they might know that. Okay. Oh. So if they want to listen in, well, they must be listening in on Facebook. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right, we're going to read from God's Word, and we're going to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and verses 4 to 15. Right then, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and verses 4 to 15. For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? For what is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. For neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. <coughs> he who plants and he who waters are one. And each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's fields, God's building. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I lay the foundation, and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work 
will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. And may the Lord bless his word to us again this morning. But we're going to uh, come before God in prayer, so let's all pray. Our gracious God and Father, we come again in your presence. We come to worship you and praise you. We realize afresh this day what it is to be a child of God, to be born again of your spirit, to have that second birth, that transformation, that change within us that makes us a new creation in Christ Jesus. change that you have brought in our souls, that we are not as we once were. And we look forward in anticipation to what we shall be when we shall be in glory with you. And then we shall see Christ as he is. When we see him as he is, we shall be like him. Oh, what joy fills our hearts as we contemplate and realize what you have in store for us. We realize that I have not seen or hear heard and I have entered into the hearts of men things that God has prepared for them to You have revealed it to us by your Spirit. For your Spirit searches the deep things of God and has revealed them to us. We thank you for that life and for that illumination that comes through that ministry of your Holy Spirit, who has brought us and taught us things that we could never, ever have comprehended, except the Spirit of God and opening the eyes of our understanding. We might truly grasp and understand the true nature of salvation. That we might understand why Christ came into the world to die for sinners. We realize that without his death there could be no forgiveness of sins. Because we realize it is through the shedding of blood that there is forgiveness. There is reconciliation. There is redemption. We thank you, Lord, that there is peace to be found only and in the person of your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray that his name again might be glorified and magnified throughout this land. We realize that many shall preach the everlasting gospel this day. We shall tell the glad tidings that Jesus saves. We pray that those who are deaf might hear and those who are blind might see. And those who are dead in their sin might be raised to newness of life. Lord, we realize that it is not lying in the power of men to do this, but we realize that in you you can do all things. Nothing is impossible with you. So we do pray for those who are lost, those who are outside of your kingdom, that truly they might be brought into that kingdom of the living God, that they might be translated into the kingdom of your dear Son, that they might know what it is to experience the power of God transforming them and renewing them and bringing them to that place of salvation, and that they might cry aloud to you that you would have mercy upon them, and that they might turn to you in genuine repentance and faith, believe that you are the only true living God, that they might come and realize that there is a way back into God from the dark paths of sin, and that you will, O oh God, open their blind eyes to see the, the one who has said that I am the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man comes into the Father but by me. The Lord, having seen him to be the truth, to be that way, that truly they might come and come to know you and to know his life eternity. Lord, do this, we pray, that Jesus Christ in all things shall be again glorified and magnified, that your Son shall be lifted up. You have given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And so, Lord, we pray that you would magnify him again. You have sent your Spirit that he might take the things of Jesus and reveal them unto us, and he might glorify him. And this is what we would pray for this day, even in this place. Christ might be lifted up and Christ might be exalted and we might see something more of his beauty and something more of his glory. And we might realize afresh this morning what it is to know the Savior who loved us and gave himself for us. Lord, we thank you for all of what he means to us this day because we realize that we could never, ever approach you except through your Son. 
they have that exhortation to us and we would come to your throne of grace with boldness and with confidence this morning. But we realize that there is a way into the We realize there is a way into the holiest of all. We realize that we can come and call upon you. And you are the God who condescends to meet with us and make yourself known to us. And so we pray that even this day there might be such light shone into our hearts, into our minds, that we might praise you and magnify and glorify you a great name. And so come to each and every one of us here this morning, we pray. And through your spirit, might deal with us in such ways that we might know that blessing of God be resting upon us. And Lord, that we might be encouraged to know those wonderful truths that Jesus saves. And so we thank the Warren being with us again this day and we pray a blessing upon him, upon Tom this evening as he comes. We pray, Lord, that they might be encouraged in the fellowship of your people here he will come and so anoint them with your spirit that they might speak in the power of God. So Lord, we commit all things to you. Remember us then as we lift our hearts before you and praise you and magnify you with great name. So draw near to each and every one of us, we pray, and so bless, strengthen, and encourage us. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, We're going to sing together, Almighty God, your word is cast. So I've got to hand it over to Warren now to uh, take charge. Thank you. Thank you. So good morning again. The, uh, I feel very honoured to be asked to come here because I've been looking up the list of preachers that you have and some very notable evangelical ministers minister in this place. So thank you for receiving my humble offering this morning. The subject I have for you this morning, and I hope it will come up on the screen in a moment, is this. From brown earth to brown bread. Now I need to explain that title to you. What I'm actually going to be talking about is God's plan for harvest. Now the good news is this. God's got a plan. He's working his plan in these days. And his plan is for a harvest of souls to come through Jesus Christ. But the wonderful thing is this, that God wants us 
to become a part of his plan. I said my title was From Brown Earth to Brown Bread. There's a subtitle to it, From Brown Earth to Brown Bread in 12 Not-So-Easy Steps. So as I'm going through them, you know you've got a 12-point sermon this morning. So the good thing is that when I'm getting to number 11, you know it's coming to an end. But I want you to take note of where we are in the, in the process. Now, I base my message this morning on these scriptures. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, Paul says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. I want to say that God's plan for harvest isn't that it should be a one-man show, but that God wants to bring souls through Jesus through a team. Not just the elders, not just the pastor, not just the evangelist, but God wants every one of us involved. Uh, you know that Paul sets out a threefold process. Planting, watering, and growing. And the important part of all that is the last word it is, it's God that gives the growth. We plant, we water, but it's only God can make things grow. Hallelujah. But we thank God we're in this business with God. I amplify that. I said that in this we're a team. 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 9 says, speaking perhaps of him and Paulus, for we are God's fellow workers. We're working together in this. We're very different people. We have different roles, Apollos and I. But nevertheless, we're working together to work it out. And uh, I want to tell you this morning that in God's plan of harvest in this place, let me declare clearly by the Spirit of God, God is going to see a harvest in this church, a mighty harvest, but God wants you to be a part of it. Hallelujah. But there's something even more wonderful in that statement. I think, although some Bible scholars would disagree with me, but God will show them that I'm right. <laughs> I believe that when he talks about being God's fellow workers, he's not talking about merely about him and Apollos. I think he's saying, I'm with God, I'm God's fellow worker. Do you know? Isn't it a wonderful thing that God calls us to work in him? When I was at school, I was hopeless at soccer. Well, I was hopeless at most sports. I was good at rugby because I was big, I was strong, and I played in the front row. But anything that required any skill, I was hopeless. Do you remember when you were in school, they'd pick up teams? Do you remember? Did you all do that? And they'd say, I love Joe, I love Fred, I love... Nobody wanted Warren. I was always the last one to be chosen to be on the team. But God this morning says, Warren, I want you on my team. Hallelujah. And I'm God's fellow worker. The, the, the term fellow worker is a word that we get here. Our, our English word synergy, Tom. With two people working together for a bigger outcome. And God says, Warren, I want you on my team. I want you to be working along with me, working as I work, working with me to bring about something Mighty, hallelujah. And then, in 1 Corinthians 3, 9, we have this other statement. It says, you are God's field. Now, it's from that point I get the brown earth. All harvests start with a brown field. And God says, you are it. We are it. But God's going to do something with that brown field because he's looking for a harvest. And then, in, in uh, this is second, First Corinthians 10, verse 17. I should have one in front of it. For though we, though many, we are one bread. So God is starting with a field, brown earth, and he's ending with bread, a brown loaf. Hallelujah. And I want to take you through that process. I don't pretend to know more than Paul, but I believe that all as Paul gives us a general outline, we can break that down even further. So where does this process start? I said it's from brown earth to brown bread in 12 easy steps. What's the first part of the process? Well, before I show you, 
I want to tell you a story about a friend of mine. He was a curate in a, in a, a church, opposite the church I was in in Bradford. And he got a position on local radio. I said, Steve, that's marvellous. You're there on local radio bringing in the harvest for Jesus. He said, Warren, I'm not bringing in the harvest. No, I said, you're just planting a seed. He said, Warren, I'm not even planting a seed. All I'm doing is turning over the ground. Before any planting takes place, you need to know step number one, plowing. You know the verses that speak? Matthew 13, 8. Other seed fell in good ground. And it was only the seed that had gone into the good ground that grew. <laughs> Those that have fallen by the way said the harder. And in these days, I believe that the ground, men's hearts are hardened. They trample down by the unbelief that's in our society. So we need a way. You know, I'm not only a hopeless soccer player, but I'm a lousy gardener. I, I, I'm the kiss of death to anything green. But I, but I go along to Tesco's or whatever in the spring, and I get my little pot of plants, and I, I get the little tag that's on it, and you know what it always says? First, prepare the ground. Proverbs 11, 30, whoever wins soul is wise. And we're not going to go planting, but we're going to plant where we've already prepared the ground to receive that seed. There's a lovely verse in Acts 16 and verse 14. It's about Lydia, the, sower, the, the seller of purple. This is Paul beginning his European mission. And he says, the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what said what was said by Paul. God had gone ahead of him, and he'd gone to Lydia's heart. He'd already prepared her. So when Paul spoke, it just didn't bounce off, just not in through one ear, out through the other, but it found a place in a heart that God had opened. And I think in these days more than ever, those of us who are wise in soul winning, will begin to prepare the soil. Let me suggest to you four sharp shares. And that's not an easy thing to say. Four sharp shares. You know what a plowshare is, don't you? A plowshare is, is a flat piece of metal with a sharp edge to it, and it's bent over. So as it cuts into the soil and throws it over, it's preparing the, for the farmer to come along with a seed. And I believe God puts in our hands four sharp shares to our plough. The first one is social action. Now, when I was a young Christian in the church, people used to frown when you said social action. Oh, that's what the liberal Christians do. They're always on about feeding and the, the, the hungry and, and home, finding place for the homeless. We are the spiritual ones, the conservative evangelicals. We preach a spiritual gospel. Well, let me tell you, my friend, that the gospel of Jesus Christ is a social as well as a spiritual gospel. And I rejoice that I've seen in my lifetime evangelical churches taking on their social as well as their spiritual responsibility. Uh, Gerald Booth led the way, didn't he? He says, you can't go to people and help them, op open them to the love of God when they've got cold feet and an empty stomach. And so he saw that this was asking. And I believe there are needs in this society, not the same needs that Gerald Booth saw in his day, but there are needs out here, psychological needs, social needs. There's loneliness. And God calls us on his team to begin to work in the community, to see the needs. And as we see those needs, begin to open people's hearts to the gospel that they need. The second one is personal friendship. Now I'm going to say something that you might not be happy with, but I'm going to say it all the same. You don't have to ask me again. You've asked me twice, and I appreciate that very much. When I was a boy, open airs were the big thing. My word. I have shouted on every street corner in the Rod the Valley. By I told them they were all going to hell. But you know, I didn't see one soul come to Jesus Christ. And I have learned, my friend, over the years. I believe that open air work has its place, not against it. 
but I have proved this over and over, that the most effective form of evangelism and soul winning is personal friendship. There is nothing works as much as finding someone and just getting alongside them, opening up your heart, opening up your home, opening up your life. And as they open, you find they, they, as you open up to them, they open up to you. Again, I'm going to tell you something that might cause offense, but I'm going to say it again. On one occasion, I was giving a talk on evangelism with a, with a, a New Zealander. And he was giving his lecture, and his lecture was on soul winning. But he couldn't spell. And instead of saying soul winning, he wrote S O U L. Can you see what's coming? W I N I N G. He didn't realize that winning has two ends, and what he wrote was soul whining. <laughs> No, that doesn't sit very comfortably to us. But I believe the, pro the truth of hospitality. If it's not wine, it is a cup of coffee. It's a warm meal. It's opening our lives to those that are around us. Whining souls to Jesus. And then the next sharp share is personal testimony. I know nothing more effective in touching people's hearts and lives than your personal testimony of how Jesus changed you, came into your life, transformed your family, made a new person, how you were born again, how everything changed. I think, my friend, you need to realize the power that God has put in your mouth to touch people's lives with your testimony. Not necessarily the testimony of what happened 20 or 30 years ago, but your testimony of how Jesus is alive, how he's at work today, and what he's doing for you. Hallelujah. And if I might suggest a fourth sharp share, it's personal prayer. Do you know, I found a strange thing. God seems more willing to help non-Christians than Christians. Anybody else found that? I, and I found that when I've been in a hospital visiting, and I've gone to my member, and I said, I'm going to pray with you, and uh, the other people in the ward, after they say, come and pray for me, come and pray for me, come and pray for me. You see, I've not yet met a person who's refused a prayer. And you say, well, they're not even Christians, no. But God knows their need. And graciously, we heard that lovely term this morning, we come before the throne of grace. And we can bring our neighbours, our friends. I know a church in Dover that was started because a lady was sick. And they went in to their next door they prayed for her, and the whole thing opened up. So four sharp shares. Social action, winding people to Jesus, personal friendship, personal testimony, personal prayer. So that's number one. You think that I've taken a long time. You will be pleased to know that as we get through, the points get shorter. So the last lot will go very, very quickly. So stay with me. So number two is going to be sowing. Once we've opened up the ground to receive the word, here are the scriptures. The seed, says Jesus, when he's interpreting the parable of the sower, he said the seed is the word of God. Not what was on last night's telly, not the real latest philosophical thought, not the political situation, not, not this film or that idea. There's only one thing that's going to bring souls to Jesus. It's the word of God. The word of God is a meaning. First Peter says, 1.23, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. That seed is a living thing. It might less look like a dried up pip, but there's life in it. Do you know, seeds are amazing things. They've gone into the tombs of the pharaohs in the pyramids, and they found buried with those pharaohs pots of corn, probably 2,000, 3,000 years old. They brought it out. After 3,000 years, they planted the corn, and it sprung to life because it's incorruptible. I remember 
I said I was a hopeless soccer player, a hopeless gardener, and I wasn't much of an academic in school. But I did pass O-level biology. And I remember our biology teacher, Mr. Weaver, he says, now, boys, I'm taking this pea, because a dried pea is a seed, you know that, don't you? And uh, he says, I'm going to put it in this little tobacco tin, heat it up under the Bunsen burner until it was black. And he says, boys, you think now I've killed that pea, don't you? He says, we'll see. He took it. Anybody do this in school? <laughs> put blotting paper into a jam jar with moisture? Nobody else? You did it in your school? Good school. <laughs> so, so we put it into the jam jar and blow me. That seed that had gone black. Because it couldn't destroy, the life was in it. It pushed out, first of all, a, a little shoot, which was positively phototropic and negatively geotropic. Told you I'd passed biology, didn't I? <laughs> I? And it put out a little root that was positively geotropic and negatively phototropic. That means the shoot goes down and the, and the shoot goes up. It's amazing. And uh, so, you know, seeds are amazing. God has wonderful ways of dispersing seeds. You know, every time you take that dandelion and you say, what time is it? <laughs> One o'clock, <laughs> two o'clock, <laughs> three o'clock. Do you know what you're doing? You're involved in seed dispersal because <laughs> God has made some seeds with wings so the wind can carry it. And you know, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the seed of his word, has gone on the wings of the wind by radio and television, over the, the iron curtain, over the bamboo curtain, into godless countries, and people are getting saved because God's word is going there. Hallelujah. And there are other ways. <coughs> Let me just, again, I don't want to cause offense. But God, in his wisdom, has planted the seed within the fruit. Well, why does he plant the seed within the fruit? Well, for this reason, to attract. You see, you take a grape. I mean, real grape. What's this business of uh, seedless grapes? Don't understand that, do you? And a grape is there. I, I'm not going to cause offense now, I hope. And a little bird comes along. And he says, oh, that's a nice little grape. And he takes it and swallows it, and flies away, and a hundred yards further on, he's involved in seed dispersal, and he drops it with his own package of fertilizer, so it can grow. Isn't God wonderful? And I believe that God wants to put his seed in the fruit of the Spirit. And as I know the fruit of the Spirit, I become attractive to people. And when they take me, they take it God's word with me, and they receive it. Hallelujah for that. But here's a wonderful verse. Luke 11, 37. It says, If any part of the carcass falls upon any seed grain that is to be sown, it is clean. Many years ago, I heard in Cardiff the Romanian pastor um, Richard Wurmbrand. Anybody else hear him? He wrote a very famous book called Tortured for Christ. I remember him standing there. I usually you heard him. Very powerful in the book. And he gave this horrendous scream from the pit of his stomach. He said, that's the cry of your brothers that are in prisons for the gospel in the, behind the, the Iron Curtain in the Eastern Bloc. And then he said, we true pastors had put in jail for preaching the gospel. And the communist authorities put in our places non-believers. They weren't Christian pastors. They were just positioned there by the communist government. But he said we couldn't understand it because souls were still getting saved. They were preaching and people were coming to faith in Jesus. Then he said, we read Leviticus chapter 11. Now, Leviticus chapter 11 is an interesting chapter and it's all about how death contaminates. If you touch a dead body, you become defiled by that. Uh, and more so, if a woman, it says, has a pot and a little mouse creeps into it and dies, then the pot is defiled. It says it's so defiled that you can't scrub it clean again. You've got to smash the pot and start all over again. 
But what if somebody has got a sack of seed for planting? You know, seed, when it's harvested, you use it for two purposes, to make bread and to set aside for next year's harvest. So if in your shed, you've got a, a sack of seed and a little rat comes along and nibbles at the sack and dies, you come into the shed and say, oh no, that's all my seed. No, says God. It's not. If any part of the carcass falls upon any seed that is to be sown, it's clean. The deadness in the rat can't defile the life that's in the seed. Hallelujah. And there's life in the word of God. And the deadness in the rats of those preachers, it couldn't defile the power that was in the seed of God as they preached the word of God. And it had its effect. Hallelujah for that. Do you ever wonder why some of these American evangelists, they live lives that are not honoring God, preach the truth, some of them, they preach doctors sometimes that isn't according to the word, and yet they see soul saved? Why is it happening? Because God always honors his word. The seed is the word, and the death in the rat can't affect the life that's in the seed. Hallelujah. Oh, Ecclesiastes 11 and 16, cast your bread upon the waters, for you shall find it after many days. In the morning sow your seed, and at evening withhold not your hand, for you do not know which will prosper, this or that. And then Psalm 126 verse 5, he who continually goes forth, weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. So we're going to keep on sowing, we can make friends with people who are not Christians, open our hope to them, open their hearts, and we're going to drop in God's word. And one day, hallelujah, when we get a glory, we'll be taking those sheaves with us. There's one desire I have. I've been a pastor over 50 years. I don't want to go into heaven on my own. I want to take sheaves with me. I want to take souls. I want stars in my crown. Oh God, will you help us to win souls for the Savior? But there are two types of sowing. I'm nearly finished on the sowing. And as I promise you, it will get quicker as I go on. But you need to hear this. There are two types of sower. First of all, there's the broadcaster. You've heard of broadcasting seed. That's what Jesus was talking about when he goes and sows his seeds. They throw it everywhere. My word, they can't stop. They can't help it. They, I think we call those people evangelists. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's something in them. But we're not all like that. So has God for a place for me as well in my reserved nature? Well, I'm not as reserved, is it? But in your small place, as you're part of the team, I believe there are not only broadcasters, there are one at a timers. Hallelujah. I told you about that school where nobody wanted to pick me on their team. We weren't very big on woodworking in my school. I only ever made two things in woodwork. Uh, uh, a string winder, which is a flat piece of wood with a notch in it, and a plant dibber, which is a flat piece of wood with a point at the end. And the point of, of the dibber was you put the hole in made of soil and you dropped in the seed. And maybe you're a one at a timer. God is putting in your hand a dibber so that that one person that comes along, you just drop the seed and you're going to see the harvest. Hallelujah. So we're on number three. What comes after sowing? Watering. Well, what does the Bible say about watering? Well, what is the water? In the New Testament, the water represents, well, this verse will tell us what it represents. Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart shall flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit whom those who have believed to receive. You have the seed of the Word and the water of the Spirit. Back to my primary school with a blotting paper and a peer of jam jar, we had two. In one we put water so the, what, the blotting paper soaked it up. The other we left dry. And after a few weeks, 
The one that was had the moisture sprouted. The one that was dry, nothing happened. And I believe, my friends, we need not only to be sowing the word of God, but we need the blessing, the movement, the ministry of the Holy Spirit upon us. You see, I read the verse that says we're born of the seed of God, of the word of God, which is incorruptible. But in John 3, 5 and 8, it tells us the land, do you, I'm sorry, do you know what? Something has jumped. I'm going to miss I'm going to, and I'll come back. Um, oh no, but this is it. I'm sorry. I, I, I apologize for the mess I've just made of this sermon. But you're still with me, aren't you? Are we still are talking about watering. Jesus answered and said, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. We are born of the Word, but we are born of the Spirit. Now this interesting verse. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 10 and 11. Speaking to the children of Israel after they come out of Egypt, God says, The land you were entering to take possession of is not like the land of Egypt for which you've come, which you watered with your foot like a garden of vegetables. But the land you are going to possess is a land of hills and valleys which drinks water by the rain from heaven. What he's talking about is this. You know that Egypt, where they were, was irrigated by the river Nile. And they would dig channels, canals, off the Nile, and then cut channels off that and channels off that until it came to your little garden where you planted your corn. But the trouble was, by the time the River Nile reached your garden, it was below the level of the land. So they made water wheels that you pumped with your foot to get the water up because you know did you needed the water. Well, my friend, what a George spent 40 years trying to pump it up. But God's promise is this, my friend. We don't have to work to pump it up. He's going to send us the rain from heaven. Hallelujah. And uh, Zechariah chapter 10 and verse 1. Ask of the Lord rain in the time of the spring rain. So far, I believe what I've told you is according to the word. What I'm going to share next is something that is my conviction. I don't ask you to share it, but I want one burden myself to you. For many years, I've been skeptical about revival. For me, in revival, very often the tide came in and the tide went out and left things high and dry. But over these last few years, as I've surveyed the spiritual scene in Wales, seen what our Welsh government is doing, I've come to a place, my friend, well, I believe the only answer for our nation is a divine visitation of the Holy Spirit. God, to come in revival again, pour out his spirit so that men can be saved. Remember the old song, showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops round us a falling. But I, I didn't do the first verse, did I? There shall be showers of blessing. This is the promise of love. There shall be seasons refreshing, said from the Saviour above. Showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops round us a calling, but for the showers we plead. There shall be showers of blessing. Precious reviving again. Over these hills and the valleys, the sound of abundance of rain. Showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops round us a falling, but for the showers we plead. There shall be. I want to declare at this moment my personal conviction before God, because I don't see any other way, because I don't see any other. I believe with all my heart. There shall be showers of blessing. Oh, that today they but fall, while to God with confessing. 
Why in us on Jesus we call. That's th- watering. We've reached at last number four. I'll be very quick with this one. Number four, what's next is weeding. I can be very quick with this. Uh, Jesus says in Matthew 13, 24 to 30, a man sowed good seed, but while his men were sleeping, the enemy came and sowed weeds. The servant said to him, do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, no. Gathering the weeds, you root up the wheat along with them. For weeding, what did Jesus say? Don't do it. Do you know, when I was in Bible school, because it was a short time, there was, later on at the same Bible school, there was a man who, from Yorkshire whose name was Ernest Weeding. And a young lady in Bible school fell in love with him and she wrote a love poem to him called God's Garden. A la, 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 la. I don't remember the word la, 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 la. But I remember the last one. La, 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 la. God's Garden needs earnest weeding. And the last thing God's God needs is earnest weeding. I was involved in a mini revival in the little town of Tonabatni, the revival valley. Who would most see young people come in? And one earnest weeder was in the congregation, a lovely Christian lady. The leader of, the, of these group of young men was called Arthur. And it was in days of the mullet. Do you remember? Long hair. And one evening around the piano, when all these young people were coming to faith, she said, Arthur, you're a Christian now. You should get your hair cut. She thought she was doing weeding for God. Arthur walked out, took all of them with him. So, my friend, since that day, I've been very cautious. Sometimes we've got to leave it to God for him to deal with the problems that come with those that get saved. And so after the weeding, number five, we've got to move it quickly now because of time. Reaping. Those who sow in tears as well reap with shouts of joy. Do they say that are yet four months, then come the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see the fields are white in the harvest. Sometimes we're very good at sowing, good at watering, but we're not so good at reaping. What do I mean by reaping? I believe this. Reaping is bringing those souls in whom we have sowed the seed of the word in which the spirit has been at work to a point of decision. To, uh, by decision I mean to a point where they know up, absolute assurance that they belong to Jesus Christ. God, give us grace in this Bethel evangelical church to know a reaping of souls, bringing people to a point of real assurance. Hallelujah. And let us not grow weary in well doing. For a due season, we will reap if we do not throw. Number six, I'm moving as quickly as I can. It'll go quite quickly now. In fact, I might just uh, stop a little earlier. Storing. Do you know, I had a friend, and uh, he used to do uh, street evangelism. And he'd attract. And it was like selling insurance. They said yes to every page. And in the end, they said yes. And they, they were saved. And he'd come to church on a Sunday morning and say, 14 saved on the street last night, Pastor. And I said, well, where are they this morning, Steve? Oh, he said, it doesn't matter where they are this morning. But the word of God tells me that the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. And it's our responsibility not just to bring them the decision, to make them a part of God's body, to make room for them, give a place to them, to bring them into God's house. Oh, we're on number seven. Can I have just five more minutes? I go through this quickly. I know I've gone on quickly. I go as quickly as I can. But God isn't just wanting to fill his barns. That's what pastors want to do. Oh, I've got this double in my church. I've got that double. God isn't concerned about that. He's got a purpose. He's making bread. And in order to make bread, he's going to bring corn out and he starts threshing it. And threshing is an interesting process. Isaiah 28 says, Dill is not threshed with threshing sledge. Nor is the cart wheeled over a cubic, but dill is beaten out of the stick and cubic with the rod. When you get the corn, it's got a husk around it. And that's no good for the bread. You've got to get at the kernel. And when we come to Christ, very often there are lots of things. And God has to get those things away from us. So he puts us through a threshing, a beating. And some people need a cart over them. Some just need a sledge. Some just with sticks. But don't be surprised, my friend, when you come to Jesus Christ, 
that God puts you through a threshing. I would. But after the threshing, there's winnowing. You see, when they've threshed it, the husks and the curd are all mixed together. And there's two ways of dealing with it. There's to throw it up in the air with a shovel. You remember what Jesus says? His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing fork. He throws it up in the air, the wind comes, blows away the husk, and the kernel falls to the ground. And sometimes after we come to Jesus, we have a, a threshing, and then we go through a winnowing, and we say, what's happening, Lord? It's all up in the air. He's not only getting, separating you from the husk, but he's taking it out of your lives. And then, Lord, well, I've been threshed. I've been winnowed. Surely I'm ready now. No, he says. The next step is grinding. He says, you shall bring from your dwelling places two loaves of bread to me. They shall be of fine flour. His mills of God grind slow, but they grind exceeding small. In the Jewish religion, it was a wonderful religion, when you came to church, sometimes you take a loaf of bread with you and you give the priest a wave. And I like that kind of church myself. Uh, but that loaf was special. It couldn't be made with any of flour. It was fine flour. And God's making bread of us. And he wants to find us. So he puts us through, the, good through the mill. God's grinding you down. Let me walk quickly. This missile scripture says. And you say, Lord, I've been threshed, widowed, crowned. What, uh, what's next? He says, leading. They take the flour. He says, am I not ready now, God? Oh, no, God says, I'm making bread. I'm going to join you with everyone else. When I was a boy, I used to love putting my head in through the, the door of the, of the baker's next, in our street. And you'd see him kneading the bread. He'd get two in his hand and he'd bash the living needles out of it. Then he'd put it on the shelf to prove to rise. And after a while, he'd take it out and give it a bit of bashing. Feel it having a bashing? That's what God is doing. He's knocking us together because he's making bread out of us, bringing us together. Well, Lord, I'd be threshed, widowed, ground, uh, kneaded, Surely not more. Yes, says God. You never live. There's baking. You know, God's going to put you through the fire. When you walk through the fire, you should not be burned. And the flame should not consume you. Ephraim is a cake, not turned. Do you know, God doesn't want you half-baked. Some of the, one of my favorite aromas is that of baked, freshly break bread. Anybody like it? You know, it's nicer to my mind than Chanel number five. Oh, freshly baked bread. And I have known that fragrance in the lives of some wonderful Christians who have gone through the fire of God's testing. And it hasn't burned them, it hasn't scarred them, but it's brought from their lives a wonderful aroma. Uh, I'm just going to go very quickly. And then... So, after the baking, surely, after number 11, we have the brown bread. God's got a purpose. He's got a purpose for this church. He's got a harvest. And not just to bring the, fill it with numbers, but to produce something wonderful. At the beginning, I said, those were, how many steps did I say they were? I said 12. How many steps has it taken to get to the bread? I did not notice. Eleven. Oh, you were mistaken, Warren. No. There's a twelfth step. God has made his bread, his baking bread, so that it can be broken to feed a hungry world. May God bless you. May God give it this place by his spirit, through the word, a mighty harvest for the glory of Jesus. Nigel's going to lead us in the last song now, shall we? I think it's number four. Christ is our cause. I'm asking Nigel to come and take it because I don't know it. But I'm assuming that you do, Nigel. May God bless you.